morning, Origins Church. We're glad that you're joining this morning, and again on a morning that just doesn't seem like it's a normal Sunday morning. We're glad that you're joining us online or in television at home. We're glad to be a part of your family when, when the church is shut down because of this coronavirus. We wanted to shut down the church again for one more week because several members of our congregation have the COVID. Some have been exposed to it, so we just really want to protect our church family over the next couple weeks. Also, let's have a special prayer for the Burging family. Jim has been tested positive for COVID. He's been home, he's been struggling with, with breathing and with coughing, and on Friday, so Ann brought Jim to the hospital, and he was admitted to the hospital because the, the virus is attacking some forms of his heart. Jim needs our prayers, Sue Ann needs our prayers, but also their daughter, Rachel, also has been tested positive, has been going through some difficulties with the virus also. So we may see this virus as something that, that's out there that people talk about in other states, but it's a virus that affects all of us. It's a personal thing. It's a, a part of our lives, and we want to keep you safe, but also we want to be a part of your life weekly at home, and hopefully again we can have church again soon that we can be united as a family. Please remember to think of the church in your giving. You can give online or you can mail your checks to, to the church. We need to continue to support our church and the expenses that we have. But also we are a part of mission. And, uh, excuse me, on November 22, we'll be collecting the boxes for Samaritan's Purse as we have done in other years. And we have a goal uh, of reaching children around the world. So please, uh, Remember, on November 22, and we'll be collecting those boxes, and hopefully we'll have church going by then, and then we can have the boxes here and collect them here at church. So, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day that you have given to us. It's a day to celebrate in your love and grace and uncertain and trying times. We know that there are families of our congregation who are struggling who are hurting, who are trying to find their way in life. And Father, we especially uplift the Bridging family. We think of Jim in the hospital. We just pray for your comfort and peace, for healing, for strength. We pray for Rachel. She struggles with the COVID. We also think of Sue Ann at, at home, unable to, to be with Jim. And we just pray that your arms of grace and mercy may surround her. Father, we think of others of our congregation who have tested positive or who have been under quarantine, we know that that's difficult times. And we just pray that you'll work through them in grace and mercy and health, that you may protect them. And Father, we think of Bob and Julie Rinzema, a family that, that we love and care for, and we know that your arms of grace and mercy are around them. Be with Bob and Julie. We're so thankful that Julie could return home. And we just pray that you may bless them in a very real way, that they can again return to worship with us because we know that they are such a blessing to us. Father, in a moment of silence, we lift our own prayer concerns to you, knowing that you will hear and answer our prayers. Thank you, Father, for this time of holding your hand, of you calling us to come to you, to, to be close to you, to share our concerns and our joys with you. And Father, we know that you've rejoiced with us this past week when we found joy and excitement. You've been with us when we've had those hard times and difficult times and even those times of tears. We thank you that you never leave us, that you never will forsake us, and that you will call us your children. And that's something we praise you for. Thank you, Father, for, for your love and grace, and especially the love that you've shown to us through Jesus Christ, that will offer us eternal life through his death of the cross, that we can live eternally with you as we seek you for forgiveness. Father, thank you. We praise you. And we pray that your word may speak into our hearts today as we study your word and as we live your word throughout the week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I invite the congregation to turn your Bibles to Psalm 139. 
Psalm 139, and the topic of this morning's message is God knows. Last week we studied one of the Psalms that when we face those difficult times, when those times that we, we want to throw in the towel and say, I, I don't know if we can do it anymore. And today, I just want to emphasize after this crazy week of elections, there's still the politics that are out there, and sometimes we just wonder, what's going on? But I just want to assure you that God is in control and that He knows. He knows what's going on. He, he knows what the future will bring. He knows our lives, and He cares so much for us. And that's the hope that I want to bring to us today. God knows, and God cares for us. Psalm 139, beginning of verse 1. There was a Bible college student, and he came up to the great teacher of the Bible, Charles Spurgeon, one day. And he said, Professor, I'm greatly concerned. I, I, I study God's Word, and, and I read through the Bible, but there are times that I just don't grasp the meaning of it all. I have a hard time understanding what the Bible wants to tell me. And this noted wise old preacher kindly replied, he said, young man, let me give you this word of advice. Give God the credit for knowing the things that you don't understand. Give God the credit for knowing things that we don't understand or, or comprehend. We look at the world around us and, and we wonder, what's going on? I don't understand, God, why you're doing it this way. Why does there have to be hurt and pain? Why does there have to be this COVID? Why does there have to be unemployment? Why does there have to be such political division? God, I just don't understand. But God knows everything. And give the Lord credit for knowing the things that, that we don't understand. Because God is in control. In Isaiah chapter 55, 8 and 9, it says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. God understands and He knows even in the times when we are confused and lost and we don't understand. And yes, at times it's hard to understand what's going on, but God knows and He has a plan. When Harry Norris Russell, a Princeton astronomer, had concluded a great lecture on the Milky Way, a woman came up to him and asked, you know, if our world is so little and small compared to the Milky Way and the, the universe that is so great, can we ever believe that God pays attention to us? Can we ever believe that God pays attention to little old me? And Dr. Russell replied, that depends, madam, entirely how big is your God that you believe in. When we're confronted with all these questions and doubts and we don't understand, just believe that we have a great God. God is quite big. He is all wise. He is all knowing. He is all powerful. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows us from the inside out. He knows everything about us. You have searched me, O oh Lord, and you know me. And that should give us peace when we lay our head on the pillow at night to thank God for another day and for knowing me, who I am and what I stand in need of. The psalmist in 139 declares that God knew David. And this psalm describes how God also knows us. Psalm 139, beginning with verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and, and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. That is quite amazing. O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. Out of all the people in the world, God knows me. And that's the first thing we need to understand is God knows us and he knows our activities. 
I was reading a humorous story this past week that there was a man selling vacuum cleaners and he knocked on a door of a remote farmhouse in Kansas. And when the lady of the house opened the door, he walked in and he dumped a big bag of dirt on the floor. Now boasted the salesman, I want to make a bargain with you. If this super duper new vacuum cleaner doesn't pick up every bit of dirt that I dumped on your floor, I'll eat what is left. The gentle older lady slowly turned around and she went to the kitchen and she returned to the super duper salesman and she handed him a white, uh, spoon. And that elderly lady says, we don't have electricity. Huh. If that man would have known that the house didn't have electricity, he would have never dumped the dirt on the floor. He would have made a better offer. But wouldn't it be nice if we could know some things in advance? Wouldn't it be nice if we could have our, our life planned out and have it perfect and we could just move along and, and enjoy life? It sounds like it'd be a good thing, but it might not. Knowing certain things in the future may create negativity in our lives because we know when things are going to happen and we'd start to worry ourselves to death. Some foreknowledge is not good for us, but God knows what's in our future and He cares for us. God knows all of our activities even before we plan them. You know, I like to plan my day. I get ready at a certain time and I drive to work and I, I sit in the office and I have things planned of what I'm going to do. And there are some unexpected things that come up, but nothing is unexpected for God. He knows when things will happen even before they happen. And what amazing God creator we have. God knows us. And he cares for us as a father cares for his children. Dr. John Bailey made it a practice as he was a teacher and he'd often start his class on the doctrine of God with these words. We must remember, students, that in discussing God, we cannot talk about Him without Him hearing every word we say. We may be able to talk about our friends as if they are not here and behind, our, behind their backs. But God is everywhere. Yes, even in this classroom. Therefore, in all of our discussions, we must be aware of His infinite presence and talk about Him as we are talking to him face to face. That professor just wanted to remind the students again that God is here and he knows us and he hears us. <coughs> we need to take that attitude every day. God is with us and he knows what's going on. We're always in His presence, and that thought should make a difference in everything that we do. <coughs> how wonderful, and how amazing it is, realizing that God is with us, and that He knows us. But the second thing that we can learn from this psalm is that God knows our thoughts. He knows what we're thinking about. So, on an average day, what do we think about? Becoming wealthier? The anger that we have for someone else? The lust in our thoughts and our minds? <clears throat> what do we spend time thinking about? In Psalm 139, verse 2, it says, You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar, he knows what we're thinking. How important are our thoughts? In Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We are generally a product of our thinking, which means that we must set our minds on good things and, and godly things and do good things. And to think good things often. But so often we become negative Nellies and, and we start dwelling in, in all the bad stuff around us and we start thinking about the bad things and, and pretty soon it's the bad things that consume our heart and all we can do is talk about the bad. But God says, ho, ho, ho. 
I know your thoughts. Think good things. And good things will come out of your heart. Henry Ford, with all of his ideas in the automobile industry, he said this, A man is full of ideas, and they're not always good. And we can see that in the world that we live in. There are a lot of people around us, and there are a lot of impure thoughts. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of hatred. And there's a lot of unforgiveness. In Romans 1, chapter 18, verse 25, it says this. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the godliness and the wickedness of men who surpass the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His internal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over to their sinful desires, their hearts to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who was ever forever praised. Amen. The people knew about God. They knew His plan, they knew His word, and yet they were slowly enticed of the worldly things. And it sounds like today, it's easy for evil thoughts to have taken over. We watch TV and at times we're embarrassed of what we see. We're embarrassed of what we see on, on billboards as we travel down the road. And then we look at our hearts, filled with bitterness, filled with, with unforgiveness, filled with anger. And that starts to come out of our heart. You see, I see that in the world. That when people stop believing about God, and they stop worshiping Him as the true God, evil has a place to come in, and evil can do awful things. People without God in their heart are just drawn to the unholy. God knows what we're thinking. And I ask you this morning, what is in your heart? Is it godly or is it evil? You know, the world needs to see godly people of forgiveness and grace and peace and kindness. But also, people that have standards that we're just not going to give in to everything. The world needs to see God and His justice, and yet the church fails. We have this thing called political correctness, and, and we, we try to be, be nice. We try to give into the world because we don't want to offend anybody. But God is still calling His servants to stand up for truth and righteousness. He knows what's in our heart. Matthew chapter 9, verse 4, Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, Why do you entertain evil? Why do you have those thoughts in your heart? We need to think about that every day. That God knows what's in my mind and my thoughts. And when I'm driving down the road and I get cut off, He knows when I'm angry. He knows when I lose my temper. He knows when, when I, I think those thoughts badly about people. And we need to create a clean heart so that my heart may share good things. God knows our thoughts. Another thing, God knows what we speak. In verse 4 of this morning's scripture passage, we read, Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. That's amazing. 
God knows what we're going to say even before we say it. That, that burst of anger, that, that dirty joke, the, the cursing, the swearing. God knows what we say before we say it. There's a father and son working together on the family farm, and the little boy was only about three and a half, four years old, and he looked up to his dad in an amazing way. There's no one greater than his dad as he's working on this, on this big machinery. And that little boy wanted to be right there helping his dad and watching his dad. He had to wear the blue jeans and the cap and the, the plaid shirt, and he wanted to be just like his dad. Well, as his dad was working on the cultivator, he was working with a big wrench, and his hand slipped, and his hand got smashed on, on the disc blade, and a bunch of bad words came out of Dad's mouth. And right after he said it, he looked down at his little boy, and he just thought, oh, man, I blew it. And he just stopped for a moment, and he took his little boy in his arms and said, I'm sorry that you had to hear it. I shouldn't talk that way. And that little boy had a smile on his face and says, Dad, don't worry about me. God heard you too, and I don't think he liked it. The little boy listened in Sunday school. God hears you too, and I don't think he likes it. God does hear our speaking regardless of what we say and, and how we say it. Before we speak, He knows what we're going to say. And Shouldn't this cause us to pause before we say words and to think about what difference we can make in the words that we share? Matthew chapter 12, verse 33 and 34 says this, Make a tree good and its fruit will be good. Or make a tree bad and its fruit will be bad. For a tree is recognized by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? But out of the overflow of the heart, your mouth speaks. Again, our speaking reveals what's deep down inside our heart. If we speak it, then it's right here. And if we speak bad, negative, nasty, evil words, those are the things that are living in our heart, which means that we have a heart problem. What comes out of our mouth should be God-pleasing. It should bring peace and grace and health and strength to other people. In Mark chapter 12, verse 36, David himself said, Speaking by the Holy Spirit, declared, Wouldn't we be great if we could all speak by the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit empowered all of our speaking? David himself, speaking by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 and 30 says, Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only in what is helpful in building others up according to their needs, so that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Don't, don't, don't break God's heart by the words that we say. I love to spend time with people. I love to share people, to share with people, and just to sit with them and listen to their stories. And the people that I like to spend time with are those who speak good things. The people that I like to spend time with, they don't tear others apart. They don't gossip on their lips. There are no foul words out of their mouth, nor their dirty jokes. Instead, the people that I really enjoy spending time with they're filled with kindness and, and praise and good things. So as we think about the world around us and that God is in control, knowing that he knows what's coming out of our mouth. Fourthly, God also knows our plans. He knows what we're going to do before we do them and uh, he knows about our life. And we can't run from God. Verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the seas, even your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. 
Wherever we are at, God is there. He knows what we're doing. We can't hide from God. We can't say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flee from God today until, until I, you know, I say good things. I, I know I did bad, so I'm going to hide. I learned that lesson when I was in junior high. Young kid, and I said something terrible about the pastor. Can you imagine that? That I said something bad about the preacher. Well, the news got out into the consistory, the church leadership, and the church leadership had to, to figure out, you know, why did I say these bad things? And pretty soon the, the elders of the church were meeting with my father, and, and I saw them on the farmyard. I, I knew that I was in trouble, and I had to hide. I had to get out of there. So the only place I could hide was in the hayloft of the barn. And I crawled up into that deep hayloft and I found a couple bales of straw and I was kind of squished between those two bales and, and I could only cry. Because I knew I did wrong. And I got caught. And I knew if I could just wait up there a couple hours, Dad would go home and I could crawl out and I could return home too. But the amazing thing is, is God knew where I was, but also my father did too. And I remember him walking into the barn, calling out my name, saying, Brad, I know you're here, let's talk. He knew where I was, and he wanted to talk. Not to punish me, but to talk. To forgive and to care. God, it's the same for us. We want to run away and we want to hide and we think God will never find me, but God knows where we're at. And He wants to care and to forgive. God knows our plans and, and we can't hide. As I look at our nation and as I study politics and I see what's happening, there is a, a trend towards socialism and the government giving us what we want and taking care of us. Well, in 1917, there are only 40,000 followers of communism in the world. But in 1925, their leaders met to formulate plans to conquer the world. Lenin said this, First we shall take Eastern Europe, then the masses of Asia, and after that we shall surround and undermine the United States, who will fall into our hands without a struggle. At various times, Khrushchev boasted, Whether you like it or not, history is on our side, and we will bury you. And on American television in 1957, he declared, I can prophesy that your grandchildren in America will live under socialism. Wow, what a prediction. In the 1980s, President Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, thinking that it would end socialism and communism. And we celebrated. It didn't work and it didn't affect our country. It didn't work. Or will it? You see, when we live apart from God, evil things happen. And is socialism the new religion of our world where we trust in society and we trust in politics and we trust in our government to give us what we need rather than our trust in God? It's easy for our young people to vote because they're going to get, quote, free things, free medical care, free education, free things. But when we trust in the government more than we trust in God, it's not going to work. But God knows our plans. God knows what's ahead for the United States with, with a new president. He knows what's ahead the next four years, eight years, 16 years. Often plans will change or they'll get changed by God. I never expected my life to be as it is, but God has been good, 
And we should always be open to God changing our plans and our lives and even where we live. But here's the key. Don't give in to the government. Don't think that the government is going to be the answer to everything that we need. But it says, seek first the kingdom and his will and his plans. Seek God's kingdom and not the world's ways. I can hold firm in the future, in tomorrow, knowing that God is in control. And that all I'm asked to do is to God give God praise and honor and glory and follow his word and his leading. Because God cares for me. Because God knows. In James chapter 4, 13 through 17, it says, Today or tomorrow we will go to this city or that city. We'll spend a year there and carry on business and we'll make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for just a little while and then it vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will do this and do that. As it is, you boast and brag, and such boasting is evil. Anyone then who knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do, and not sin. God is in control. We can have all our plans made, but God says, hey, do it my way. Seek my kingdom, and not the world's. And the last thing that we learn from the scripture passage in Psalm 139 is that, that God knows us, but he knows where we began. Listen to this, verse 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that beautiful? David says, I can praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I know that full well. I was not hidden from you when I was made in a secret place. I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes, God, saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book forever, before one of those days ever came to be. Those are powerful words. God knows us before we were born, and he has a plan for our life. Life in the womb. This election may not be what we wanted or expected when it comes to pro-life. But I say to the church, we need to protect the lives of the unborn. We are their protectors. Life is precious, and God knows every child before they're born. David proclaims, you created me in my mother's womb. That's a little person. Why doesn't the world understand that? That's a God's child. So let's look at birth, shall we? On October 5, my life began. My parents don't know it yet, but I am already a little person. And I'm going to be a girl. It says I'm going to have blonde hair and blue eyes. Just about everything is settled, though. And I think I'm going to love flowers. That was October 5. So we jumped to October 19. A lot of people say that I'm not a real person yet, that only my mother exists, but I am a real person. Just a small crumb of bread is all I am, and yet I'm alive. My mother is, and so am I. October 23. My mouth is just beginning to open now. Just think. In a year or so, I shall laugh. And later, I'll be talking. And I hope my first word is, Mama. October 25. Remember, conception on October 5. October 25, 20 days, it says. My heart began to beat today all by itself. From now on it shall gently beat for the rest of my life without ever stopping to rest. And after many years it will tire, it will stop, and then I shall die. November 2. I'm growing little by little every day. My arms and my legs are beginning to take shape. But I have to wait a long time yet before those legs will raise me up to my mother's arms. 
It'll be a long time before these little arms will be able to lift up to my mother for her to pick me up. It'll be a long time before these little arms will be able to gather flowers and embrace my dad. November 12. Tiny fingers are beginning to form on my hands. Funny how small my hands are. Maybe I'll be able to stroke my mother's hair with them. November 20. It wasn't until today that the doctor told my mom that I am living in her body. Oh, how happy she must be. Are you happy, Mom? Dad must be so excited to hear that he's going to have a child. November 25. My mom and dad are probably thinking about what they're going to name me, but they don't even know I'm a little girl yet. I want to be called Kathy. I'm getting so big already. December 10. My hair is growing. I hope it will be bright and shiny. I wonder what color hair my mom has. December 13. I'm just about able to see it's dark around me. When mom brings me into the world, it will be full of sunshine and flowers. But I want more than anything to see my mom. I want to see my dad. How do you guys look? December 24. I wonder if mom hears the whispering of my heart. Some little kids come into the world sick, but my heart is so strong and healthy. It beats so evenly. Mom, you're going to have a healthy little girl. December 28. Today, my mom killed me. Taking the life of a precious child. God knows our beginning. He knows before we are born. And He wants us to live. He wants us to grow and honor Him, to love His Word, to seek Him in prayer, and to walk with God every day because God knows who we are and He knows what we need. He knows what we say. He knows what we think. He has everything under control. You have searched me, O Lord, and you know me. The Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, it says, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription, The Lord knows who are His. Everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. God knows who are His children. And that's what we celebrate today. We are His children. We are forgiven. We have been washed in the blood. And we can look forward to eternal life. We need not fear what tomorrow will bring. We need not fear what the next years will bring. God knows. And He's in control. And He said, I have given you life so that you can have it abundantly. I'm here for you. The Lord knows that if we belong to Him, if we believe in Him, if we trust Him, and we're seeking to obey Him, He cares for us, and He has a plan for us. So I ask you this morning, do you know God? Do you know of His grace and love and forgiveness? And if you do, can we bring that to a hurting and a broken world? To people who are lost, who are struggling, who have questions about the church and hatred towards the church and, and hatred towards God's people. Can we bring that light and that grace to a hurting world? Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 says, Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And we turn to our Father and say, I'm willing to follow you. I place my life in your hands. Let's do some amazing things. You know, we can be concerned about the future. We can all panic over the events of this past week and the election. But, but please don't do that. Pray for our leaders. 
pray for the President of the United States, for the House of Representatives and the Senators and the judges. Pray for our local leaders, that God may work in their lives. Pray and be amazed at what God's going to do, and He knows us. And if we are people with great thoughts, God will bless us. If we're people that speak good words, and helpful words, and kind words, and forgiving words, be amazed at what God will do. Let's be the church, and let's make this world a better place. A place of God's grace and peace, a place that knows God's word, a place of forgiveness, a place of truth, and a place where the light of God shines. That is the church. And if we truly know him, we will seek to do God's will in our life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word this morning of how you know us and how you know our hearts, you know the words that we say, and you care for us. And Father, let us bring that, that hope, the joy of salvation, the joy of Christ into a hurting world as we go into the season of Thanksgiving and then Christmas. Father, may good words come out of our mouth and out of our heart. May we show to a world that you are in control and we need not fear. And let us be amazed at what you will do for us, for our country, and for the world if we return back to you. Father, I know that you are giving us a huge message. Return to me. Father, may we return to you and embrace your love and grace. In your name we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, I hope you have a good week. Stay safe. Be prayer warriors for the church. Be encouragers for those around you. And may God surprise you in an amazing way as you live for him. Go in peace. Amen.